the slow build. Food security exists when all people at all times have physical, economic, and social access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food to lead active and healthy lives. You know, when we talk about global food security and climate, I'm really proud of the steps that have been taken the last seven years to equip American producers to be able to meet the challenge of a world population that will continue to grow, the need for more food, and to do it in a way in which we can deal with the adverse consequences of a changing climate. The greater the changes in climate, the greater effects on food security and the greater effects on food systems. We've had a tendency in the past to only focus on how climate affects the growth of crops. How will climate change affect the yield of a crop? And can we take steps to adapt to those changes? And uh, the story is so much more extensive. From the farm where food is produced, all the way through how it's stored, how it's processed, how it's transported and ultimately how it's made available for us to consume. Climate change will affect global food security in two major ways. The first way is a direct impact of climate on agricultural production all around the world, which will then reduce the amount of food available, increasing prices. The second major way is through the global food system. Each of those elements may be very vulnerable to climate. So for production, changes in temperature, changes in precipitation, pests and disease can have a tremendous impact. Sea level rise and storm surge can have a profound effect on port function and grain storage and the ability of container ships to dock in different places, both in the United States, but on the other end as well, where food might be exported. All of that is a relatively complicated chain that is best examined as a system. And when climate changes occur, they will affect all of those links in the chain. Adaptation to climate change is changing the way you do things in order to lessen the impacts of climate change. For example, farmers can change the way they manage their crops. Irrigation is another adaptation measure that can have a positive impact, but it depends on the availability of water. But there are also biophysical limits. There are some temperatures that are just too hot for crops to grow. The good news is that there are a lot of adaptation options. The bad news is that adaptation capacity is closely tied to wealth. The wealthier a society is, the more capacity it has to adapt. The poorer a society is, the less capacity it has to invest in adaptation. But it's important to recognize that adaptation potential has limits. Is climate change inevitable? Is it something that we can in some way influence? Yes and yes. For any given level of climate change that we might experience in the future, the impacts of that climate change can be made a lot worse or a lot better depending on the conditions of society, how fast population might grow, how much incomes might rise around the world, how fast technology might develop, how the nature of agriculture might change. All of these factors influence food security. And so considering a range of possible alternative futures is the best way we have of planning responses that would make sense however the future unfolds. Climate change is likely to be detrimental for global food security. But there's a lot more to it than that. Climate change will affect food security outcomes in ways that matter for the U.S. 
They'll matter for U.S. producers and they'll matter for U.S. consumers, just as they matter for producers and consumers all around the globe. I think the fundamental responsibility of the U.S. is to lead. And then because of our great university systems, we are in a position to do a lot of research to be able to identify ways in which we can really move the dial. We've seen extraordinary productivity increases in the U.S. despite a changing climate. Uh, we need to share that information. We need to continue to be at the cutting edge of agricultural research. And we need to do it in a sustainable way. Uh, so a lot of fronts where the U.S. has, I think, a leadership responsibility and duty. Thank you for that. And I'd like to invite our panelists now to take the stage. And while they're doing so, I will remind everyone that just a little about the format of today's panel. Um, each of the speakers will give some remarks, and at the end of this, we will have a question and answer session. So remember to jot those questions down, um, and we'll, ask, uh, we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. And for anyone watching online, remember to get your questions in using the hashtag Ask U.S. Center. So to introduce our distinguished panel, on our far right here is uh, Secretary Tom Vilsack. He is the 30th Secretary of the United States Department of Agriculture. Uh, next to him is Earthrin Cousin, the Executive Director of the World Food Progr Program. Uh, next to her is Peter Backlund, who is one of the lead authors on the climate change, global food security, and the U.S. Food System Report, as well as the Associate Director of Colorado State University's School of Global Sustainability. And next to him is Dr. Margaret Walsh who is with the U.S. Department of Agriculture's uh, Climate Change Program Office and is another lead author of the Climate Change, Global Food Security, and the U.S. Food System Report. Well, good afternoon to everyone. I'm uh, pleased to be back uh, uh, to discuss this uh, very, very significant report that I think is going to inform uh, in a significant way uh, the discussion about global food security and climate change. It should encourage aggressive action on behalf of uh, countries like the United States uh, to increase productivity, to focus on more resilience, and to reduce emissions related to agriculture. Uh, this report, the Climate Change, Global Food Security, and U.S. Food System Report, was the work of over 19 entities. And I want to take this uh, opportunity to thank all of the officials uh, from government, from the NGOs and the university community uh, that, was, uh, that were involved in the formulation of this report. And I'd point out to you that uh, this is a report that went through the stringent scientific review that you would expect a report of this uh, magnitude uh, to go through. Uh, so we are pleased to present it today. Uh, and I want to just uh, take a, a, mo a moment or two to discuss some of the elements of this report in a, a very general way, uh, because I think the other panelists will be discussing it in, in more detail. One of the first things that struck me as I looked at this report was the fact that it does indeed provide a holistic and comprehensive review. As was suggested in the video, too, all too often we look at climate change and agriculture and stop at the issue of will we be able to produce enough food? Uh, we don't go into the discussion that this report focuses on. Are we going to be able to get the food that we are able to produce? Will it be accessible? Will, will we be able to get it from where it's being produced to where it's being needed? That gets us into a discussion of transportation. Will that food be properly utilized? That is to say, will we, uh, uh, will we ensure that it's safely stored? Will we ensure that the nutrient value of the food will be fully recognized and what is climate change's impact uh, on the utilization of food? And will there be a stable and secure supply of food? Uh, so this report goes into a rather significant detail on each one of those issues, on the availability issue, access, utilization, and stability. And there are some serious uh, findings of this report that all of us need to take into consideration. Uh, there's no question that climate change will have an impact on uh, global food security. The question is, how big an impact? What can we do to minimize uh, that impact through adaptation and mitigation strategies? Uh, it will indeed impact every aspect. It's not just the availability, it's also the accessibility of food, the utilization, and the stability of the food supply. Another interesting finding is its relationship and reaction to the American consumer. 
to the extent that we have issues where supply doesn't necessarily get to where the demand is, that may result in volatility. It may result in uh, price increases, uh, which obviously uh, will impact the American consumer and also may involve the ability of the American consumer to enjoy today the wide variety on an annual basis every month of the year, having access uh, to, to choices, uh, to variety. Uh, climate change could very well impact the mix of food that's available to the American consumer. Uh, this report, I think, underscores that adaptation matters, and adaptation can change uh, th the ultimate outcome. Uh, and so it's important for us to continue to focus on adaptation. Forecasting and metrics become important in this uh, report uh, and underscore the necessity of making sure that we are, uh, uh, that we are getting the data, uh, that we are doing accurate forecasting uh, so that we can uh, uh, address the stability issue. And finally, uh, uh, the reality that climate change, its impact on food security, disproportionately impacts the poor and poorer nations. Uh, and there's a seventh finding which I'll talk about in, in just a few minutes. What we're doing in the U.S. Uh, is to try to provide uh, assistance and not only for American agriculture, but internationally as well. Uh, early, earlier session, I mentioned our commitment to Global Research Alliance, which is a collaborative effort uh, to take a look at crop production, livestock production, rice production in a collaborative way, uh, developing adaptation strategies uh, internationally. Our Feed the Future initiative, getting information out to producers in Sub-Saharan Africa, Central America, uh, as well as Southeast Asia, the utilization of research and technology, the development of crops that will allow us to adapt more effectively to climate change, the development of climate hubs where we're assessing our vulnerabilities and identifying technologies and techniques that could be available uh, in each region of the country to increase American productivity, the Climate Smart Agricultural Alliance where there will be a sharing of information, and the 10 building blocks where we are challenging American agriculture to reduce its emissions, to contribute to the U.S. commitment of reducing emissions overall 26 to 28 percent based on 2005 uh, baseline. Uh, these building blocks are comprehensive, uh, soil health, water, uh, forest, livestock, energy uh, are being addressed. It's voluntary, it's incentive based, uh, and it has a very aggressive goal to double the rate of emission reductions within the next 10 years. I if we are able to step up our game uh, then we can minimize the impact that climate change will have on global food security, minimize the impact on poor nations, uh, and impact the impact uh, on, uh, uh, reduce the impact on American consumers. The last thing I would say that's interesting about this report and something that uh, uh, I'll end with, and that is the important role that trade plays uh, in uh, adaptation strategies. It hadn't, it hadn't occurred to me, but this report does identify the important role that trade can take uh, in terms of reducing the impact of climate change, uh, which I think encourages us to consider looking at ways in which we can enhance bilateral and multilateral trade agreements structured in a way uh, to ensure that uh, countries that are in, uh, uh, in need of food uh, assistance are able to obtain it. Uh, so I want to thank again uh, those who were involved in putting this uh, report together. I think it is an extraordinarily important report and one that I think reflects American leadership and American uh, commitment uh, on a very, very important issue. And with that, I'm not sure if it's Meg, who, who, who's next? You are? All right. Well, thank you all very much for being here. We're very pleased to be able to release this report and discuss it with you today. I'm Margaret Walsh. I'm an ecologist. I'm in the Climate Change Program Office at the U.S. Department of Agriculture and was a lead author on the Climate, Ch uh, climate Change, Global Food Security, and the U.S. Food System Report. Um, the, this has been more than a three-year effort on behalf of over 30 authors and contributors from 19 institutions around the world, representing government service, of course, but also a number of academic institutions, non-governmental organizations, intergovernmental organizations, and the like. So it really represents a very broad, very strong scientific consensus. It's a peer-reviewed scientific assessment uh, that um, uh, the brought together these authors to address the question of what are the likely effects of climate change going to be on global food security? 
And what is the role of the U.S. in a world that's likely to change profoundly as a result? So um, I'm going to do this in two parts. I'm going to discuss some key concepts, some things that we need all to have a common understanding of just in order to have this discussion. And then my colleague, Peter, um, we'll be talking about what the scientific literature, what the data, what the modeling, what everything added up to um, in terms of the conclusions of the report. So to start off, there's this question. This question. <laughs> what is food security? Um, food security exists when all people at all times have physical, social, and economic access to safe and nutritious food that meets the dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. This is the definition used by a number of governments, a number of assistance organizations, but analytically, coming at it from a scientific perspective, it's difficult to work with. Um, so what's been done is it's been broken down into four different components. Food availability, food access, food utilization, and then the stability of each of those things. A lot goes into creating each of those things, but I'm going to step back a little bit and give you sort of a simple, I, simple way of thinking of them, and it's just to ask a series of questions. So first, does food exist? That's the availability question. Now, if food exists, can you get it? That's food access. Okay, now, food exists and you can get it, can you use it? That's the question of food utilization. And then the final question, stability. How do these things change over time? Because all of these things have to be happening simultaneously in order for you to have food security. The second key concept is the food system. The food system consists of all of the activities um, necessary for the uh, provision of food. So going through some of the different pieces, we produce food. This can mean crops, it can mean livestock, it can mean fisheries or aquaculture. Um, it can also mean hunting wild game or harvesting wild forage. We process food and we package food uh, to make it more edible, to protect it from contamination or damage. We buy and sell food, that's the wholesaling and retailing se uh, section. We store food, we trade it, we transport it. We eat it, uh, and sometimes we waste it. So this is a comprehensive diagram. Uh, other, there are other food systems that, you, you may only have bits and pieces of this, right? Your food system may vary, um, but once you start to put the pieces together, it gives you a very different way of understanding your vulnerabilities to climate change and your options for addressing them adaptively. So, why is this an issue? Well, today we have about 800 million undernourished people in the world. We have about two and a half billion overnourished people in the world, and we're wasting between a third and half of all the food that we produce. What we're looking at in 2050 is a world with more people who are going to need more food, um, and we're going to need to do all that in a world of changing climate with higher temperatures, um, and a number of other variables changing. So I suspect everyone at this meeting has been looking at maps like this for uh, a long time. The effects of greenhouse gas emissions matter and the degree of climate change matters to food security outcomes. So we're looking at temperature changes, maybe between a degree or two, even up to seven degrees under the worst scenarios at the higher latitudes, um, and profound precipitation changes as well. We could also be looking at maps of sea level rise uh, or of pests and disease. A lot really uh, goes into understanding food security from the climate change perspective. But climate change isn't happening in a vacuum. Uh, we are also experiencing uh, socioeconomic change. So the social conditions and the economic conditions in the world are changing. The number of people we have, the uh, age distribution, the wealth, um, whether they're living in urban areas or rural areas, these all make a great deal of difference in terms of food security. So uh, we found it useful to look at a range of possible futures to understand how climate change might affect different worlds. And 
this is the very big picture. Uh, climate change is very likely to affect global regional and local food security by disrupting food availability, decreasing access, and making utilization more difficult. Uh, the risks are greatest for the poor, uh, in large part because of the effects of climate change on food prices. Uh, also in the tropics, because uh, plants and animals are already closer to sort of their biophysical tolerances, where they just can't grow well anymore, or maybe even can't grow at all. And so that's the really big picture. I'm going to ask Peter to take over now and um, start to fill it in for us. Thanks, Meg. So I'm Peter Bachland. I'm from Colorado State University and also one of the authors. And I'm going to take you through uh, the rest of our top level conclusions fairly quickly here. So uh, climate change's potential to affect global food security matters for the US. This is kind of a US centric finding, but it matters for other nations too. It's going to affect, uh, you know, all, all nations are kind of embedded in a global food system and they're connected. And so the U.S. and other nations could see increased costs for imports and increased demand for exports. Regions with relatively low yields per hectare are going to want advanced methods and technologies from more advanced regions and advanced producers. And an increased incidence of weather extremes like extended drought could increase the number of food shocks and could thus increase demands for emergency assistance. So you can really see the effects of climate change can kind of propagate through this, the, the food, the interlinked food systems of the world. The risks extend uh, well beyond agricultural production as, as uh, Secretary Vilsack and Meg have both emphasized two other elements of the global food systems that are really important for food security, really in a big way, processing and storage, transportation, and consumption of food. Increased temperatures are going to require more effective processing and storage to avoid the risk of increased spoilage and increased waste. And we just saw from Meg that waste is a major issue now. We don't want to do anything to exacerbate that problem. Transportation is likely to be more often affected by extreme weather conditions, in particular uh, lower levels in rivers and lakes can affect large-scale transportation of food. And increased temperatures also affect food safety, increasing risks from bacteria and fungal infections. And very interestingly, increased concentrations of CO2 themselves appear to reduce key micronutrients in some crops, including iron and zinc. So there's a lot of factors at play here. Accurately projecting these risks requires consideration of a lot of other large-scale changes. It's not just about climate and isolation. It's about the interplay of climate change and lots of other physical and socioeconomic changes. Population growth increases risk and vulnerability, while economic growth in general reduces vulnerability. Urbanization increases transportation, storage, and packaging needs, all of which can be affected by climate change. And ecosystem degradation can affect water supplies and healthy soils that really are the foundation of the production that underlies the, the entire food system across the globe. The risks really scale according to how much climate change there is. As the magnitude and rate of climate change increases, food security risk also increases. High emissions and concentrations of greenhouse gases are much more likely to have damaging effects than lower emissions and concentration trajectories. And so in the worst case, remem remembering again that we need to think about more than climate change, but in a case where high emissions and high population growth are coupled with low economic growth, we could see an increase of approximately 175 million hungry people over the roughly 800 million that, that Meg alluded to earlier, but that's, that's a very negative socioeconomic scenario combined with a negative climate scenario. If we have lower emissions, but we still have the negative socioeconomic factors of high population growth and low economic growth, we could be looking at roughly 60 million more people that are hungry. But if we can somehow couple low emissions and lower population growth with somewhat higher economic growth, we could still continue to make significant progress in reducing the number of hungry people. And I think that's a very important 
point here is that a lot of these outcomes are really subject to future human decisions and what uh, negotiators here do and what uh, economic managers and, and people all around the world do as well. We've talked a bit about adaptation already, and uh, you know it's certainly true that effective adaptation can reduce food system vulnerability to climate change and reduce detrimental effects. Uh, the agricultural community and other, you know, the agricultural producers and other food system actors have a very strong record of innovation and creativity and adaptability demonstrated really over the course of the last century. What, what's, what's occurred with food production is truly amazing and reductions in hunger. And it appears that further adaptation is feasible, but we have to recognize that adaptive capacity is likely to have limits. It's, it's not infinite. And there are a lot of factors that can impede it. And we list a few of them on this slide, but primarily poverty, lack of access to finance and credit, low education levels, and simply not sharing lessons learned uh, can all have very negative effects on the uptake and effectiveness of adaptation strategies. Meg talked about the food system and the, you know, the, the complexity of the food system. And when you look at that complexity versus the complexity of climate change, one of the things you realize is that there are multiple opportunities for adaptation interventions across the food system. On the production side, it's possible to uh, modify and enhance crops through breeding. Uh, you can grow different crops. You can alter practices on the farm. All those still have significant potential to improve the situation. Transportation networks can be extended and improved. It's a huge issue in many parts of the world simply uh, not having adequate transportation to get food from the producers to the market. And, and improved transportation can make a very large positive difference. And there are all kinds of techniques, both new techniques and traditional techniques for storage. Uh, you know, there's, it's likely that we're going to have a greater need for increased cold storage. That also has energy implications and a negative feedback into the whole climate change uh, challenge. But traditional practices like drying and salting and pickling, things like that, uh, really have potential to help deal with this issue as well. And of course, it's also possible to alter consumption uh, practices. Uh, one of the things, as you study this issue, that you realize is that everyone can't have the same habits and preferences that are enjoyed in the US and Europe today. The, the food system can't handle having everyone uh, consume at that level. So there's, there's a lot that can be done. And finally, I want to uh, emphasize and, and zero in a little bit on trade as an adaptation option. What I'm showing you here is two different scenarios, the, the, or two sets of scenarios. The ones circled in green are uh, relatively low greenhouse gas emissions coupled with, uh, with moderate trade on the left. And when you introduce freer trade into that scenario, the price effect of climate change goes down. So the free trade in uh, a relatively low emissions scenario seems to have a positive effect on price. Positive, by mean, I mean by positive that it lessens price relative to what it would be without free trade. The set of scenarios on the other side, circled in red, are a high emissions and very restricted trade world. And in that kind of a world, the modeling evidence is pretty firm that you see that the prices are higher overall, but when, there is, uh, when there's trade restriction and then you introduce additional trade restriction, the prices go up even further. So on both sides of this equation, it appears that, uh, that having free trade and you know, I would add fair trade is necessary coupled with that. But it, it really does appear that trade is one of the major options that we have, both to help keep prices down, which feeds back on access and availability of food, but it's also a very effective mechanism to get food to where it's needed, from regions that have food and produce it effectively to regions that may be experiencing temporary dislocations or other difficulties. Oops. I guess I have more on that, but uh, with that, those are our main conclusions. We look forward to taking some questions from you later. Thank you. Well, 
As the last speaker, my responsibility is to talk to you about, from the standpoint of the 785 million food insecure people, what does all this mean? So I want to start, though, by saying thank you to Secretary Vilsack and for his leadership on supporting the completion of this report and the, and the, not just the completion, but the comprehensive research by so many that went into the development of this report. And uh, for Dr. Walsh and, and, and uh, Mr. and the Associate De Director Backlund, they have the answers. So I'm not going to try to be the scientist because that's what I'm not. That, I, I am definitely not the scientist. I am a person who, as the Executive Director of the World Food Program, deals with the challenges that result from climate impact and affected populations, on climate impact and affected populations who go hungry. Because as we know, the most vulnerable people are also the people who are most susceptible to the impacts of climate change. So it's been important, it's important that I'm included in this conversation today. Because the U.S. government is a significant partner to WFP in, in ensuring our ability to perform this work. And that investment has allowed us to address the challenges of so many. But we have an opportunity here. As the entire global community came together earlier this year, and embraced Agenda 2030 as an opportunity for us to address the challenges of hunger and poverty and to provide an opportunity for peace and prosperity for the entire global community. But we recognize that none of that is possible without addressing the challenges of climate change. And in fact, that without addressing the challenges of climate change, we move backwards instead of forward. As this report so clearly articulates, climate extremes affect global, regional, and local food security, as well as global, regional, and local stability. Left unaddressed, climate change intensifies the stress on existing resources, increases scarcity, and disrupts entire societies with devastating consequences, as noted for the, particularly for the most vulnerable people. More than 80% of the world's almost 800 million hungry people live in degraded environments, prone to natural disasters. And over the last 10 years, half of WFP's emergency and recovery operations were in response to climate-related disasters, costing some $23 billion. For example, in Sub-Saharan Africa, over 90% of the agriculture is rain-fed, and that threatens not only food security, but also the stability of highly impacted communities. As an example, in Somalia, where climate affects food security and climate affects conflicts. The evidence demonstrates that periods of major drought increases the risk of high intensity conflict in that one country by up to 60%. In 2011, the famine, four million people required life-saving food. Similar patterns are emerging in communities across the Sahel, right through to the Horn of Africa. We also know that children often pay the price of climate change with their nutrition because of drought and the impact of, of, of failed harvests in Niger, children are 55% more likely to be undernourished. In Kenya, children born in drought prone areas are 50% more likely to be stunted. The global evidence is clear on stunting. Stunting increases underperformance in schools. Stunting leads to lower productivity in later life. Stunting results in lower and poor health. And stunting makes populations less resilient over the longer term. The report had a couple of key items that I'd like to highlight today. 
One of them, of course, has been talked about by each of the speakers, and that is that effective adaptation does reduce vulnerability. Adaptation works. The challenge with adaptation programs to date is that they have not been scaled up enough to support the broader populations that are required to ensure the resilience of more vulnerable people living in susceptible areas. When we talk about adaptation, what do we mean? You've heard about the agricultural adaptation activities, but we also are talking about social protection programs, including, Mr. Secretary, school feeding programs that make a difference, that keep children in school, that ensure that we build their resilience for life. We're talking about nutrition programs that support the first thousand days, that give children the mental and physical development that is required to make them capable of living life to its full opportunity. We're also talking about investing in the kinds of smart agriculture programs that were discussed by the other participants. But one thing that hasn't been talked about today, we're also talking about investing in women. We must invest in women in agriculture, in social protection programs, as well as in additional programs that will help women overcome the inequity that limit their ability to support their families in ways that will ensure food security. In WFP, we believe adaptation efforts can both address people's immediate acute needs while simultaneously supporting people's own resistance, own resilience building for recurrent crisis. Resilience may be elusive, but it is not imaginary. We can make resilience happen in populations by investing for longer periods of time in the tools that are necessary for populations to withstand the shocks and crisis that climate affected areas endure. But we must also, as noted by the other speakers, support the world's smallholder and family farmers who manage over 90% of the world's farms. Adaptation for farming is, must include innovative and complementary programs such as weather-based insurance, which we haven't talked about today. We must give smallholder farmers in these vulnerable areas the same access to risk mitigation tools like weather-based insurance that we have in the developed world. In Ethiopia, for example, the R4 Rural Resilience Initiative in, is an insurance initiative which has demonstrated its value. It enables farmers to increase their savings by up to as much as 120%. R4 was also particularly supportive of those women farmers that I talked about, who have achieved, in fact, the largest productivity gains by having this risk mitigation strategy available to them. R4 then enables vulnerable farmers to not only invest in productive assets, but also to protect their livelihoods in times of crisis. The bottom line is prevention is better than a cure. If we act to address in an anticipatory, matter, in an anticipatory manner the needs of those who are vulnerable, by to early in providing support early in response to disasters and res we know we can save lives and livelihoods and reduce the cost of response the net cost of late response is five to seven times higher than the cost of supporting multi-year resilience building activities for this reason WFP here at COP21 has launched today a new food secure climate resilience facility, a climate financing mechanism that will help us in three ways. First, by in providing the anticipatory action that is necessary to blunt the effect of ongoing and predictable and forecasted shocks. Second, by supporting and providing an additional mechanism of financing during the time of response to a shock. 
And third, and most importantly, I would say, by ensuring that our efforts don't stop when the cameras go off, when the shock is no longer at the door of that family, but we continue with the multi-year investment that is necessary that reduces that family's, uh, that increases that family's ability to endure the next strike. Because what we know about climate change is that it's not if the next strike will come, it is when the next strike will come. We know that those strikes are more intensified than they have been in, effect in the past. And we know that pa families that are affected by shocks and crises, like floods and droughts and storms, take about three years to recover from any shock. And so our ability to support their support them during that period after the shock will ensure that we have less need to support them in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for indulging me today as I speak, and I know I speak passionately because the people who we serve will never sit in rooms like this one. And their voices are only heard when those of us who have the opportunity to represent them speak passionately about what is necessary to provide a different opportunity, to provide hope. The challenges of climate change will affect parts of the world more than the others. But we know that we live on an ever-growing smaller planet. And those machines that we all use every day, when we call them iPhones, smartphones, they've made that world even smaller. And in order to ensure security for all of us, we must ensure sec food security for everyone so that every mother has the opportunity to ensure that her child grows up with the hope of a better future no matter where she is in the world. And what this report does is give us more evidence of what we can do that will make a difference, ensuring that the science is the, the science supports the, the planning of an implementation of programs that help us move forward. So I want to end where I began and thank Secretary Vilsack and the United States government for demonstrating the leadership that has given all of us who are attending this conference the optimism that we will make a difference. That we are and can and must get it right. Thank you all. Thank you for that. We have uh, time for plenty of questions. All right, I'll get here and then I'll take a couple in a row and let them answer it that way. Thank you to the United States government and all of the speakers. I'm from the Arctic Canada, but I have friends in Alaska, one of whom is sitting here. And during your talks on global food security, a question in my mind, are Inuit people, Eskimos, do subsistence hunting, bowhead, but the ice is affecting our food security, very much so. And we do use the animals which we hunt for clothing. So that means our waterproof clothing is also being affected. Has there been any studies in Alaska where subsistence hunting can be subsidized by the US government if there's ever a problem with our subsistence hunting on bowheads, which are often locked in with moving ice and icebergs melting and polar bears. Thank you so much. Those were excellent talks, but we don't have farms. Very, so. Take one more question. Tom? Oh. Hi. Um, thank you very much for the excellent question. Uh, so there are a couple of elements of food security that this touches on the um, the access issue. Can you know? Can you get the food, right? And then the utilization issue. Can you use it? Um, is this a culturally appropriate food for you? Um, yes. This report can answer 
many of those questions for you. Um, I had the privilege of doing some work um, on the North Slope of Alaska and, and had the great benefit of, of um, seeing the bowhead and um, caribou and a number of different um, uh, culturally relevant foods being harvested and people who are very closely tied to specific land areas um, have unique challenges because the plants and the animals move and you're tied to the land. And so this is a very important question. There are some studies um, and they basically say what I just said. You're, you've got challenges, but um, I think it's an area ripe for additional research. Thank you. We have a question over here. Uh, yes, hi. Um, I'm Mark Shapiro. I'm a journalist and um, writing here for Newsweek and other publications. Um, I actually read the 2013 USDA climate report, which is fascinating and really interesting to read. I look forward to reading this report. And um, one of the things that was interesting was the um, impact of crop insurance. So looking at the crop insurance payouts, of course, which have gone up significantly. And you mentioned, of course, the need for such a thing in Horn of Africa and elsewhere. Uh, and in the United States, you've had enormous rise in the payouts of crop insurance for climate-related uh, phenomenon. Um, and I was wondering if the part of this report or part of your thinking includes the notion of how you develop farming within the United States that might be more resilient to these climate changes that are obviously trans changing American agriculture. <laughs> Thank you. Well, let me try to answer that. I think, you know, clearly there is a tremendous amount of research that's taking place uh, both in, uh, within the USDA at ARS facilities uh, that has been financed in part through the National Institute of Food and Agriculture uh, that is designed to uh, address this issue. Number one, uh, new cultivars that will allow us to grow more quickly uh, particular crops, uh, work uh, that looks at ways in which we can create uh, drought resistance crops, uh, heat resistant crops, uh, crops that could potentially grow um, in, in very intense and, and uh, problematic weather today. So that research is ongoing. We also recently established uh, with the new Farm Bill a new uh, private foundation that is also going to be conducting research and really looking at the issue of photosynthesis and how that might be more uh, of, uh, effective, uh, what we can do to improve the, uh, the understanding of that and how that might ultimately allow us to be more productive. And then finally, uh, the issue of precision agriculture, uh, where we're uh, learning uh, how to analyze each individual acre uh, or hectare of land that we are farming uh, so that we can customize and tailor uh, the inputs, uh, the planting, uh, the, the, the crops that will be produced on that particular acre to, to, to utilize it in the most efficient and effective way and also in the most sustainable way. So you combine all of that activity, uh, you would be looking at a number of strategies uh, that could potentially impact uh, and reduce the risk that's associated with weather-related uh, circumstances. All right, now we have a bunch of questions, so I'll take about two or three right now and let the panel um, answer them that way. Thank you. Okay, sure. Um, my name is Mark Pershin, and I'm from an organization called Less Meat, Less Heat. My question, I just want to elaborate one of the findings uh, from the report that was, I guess, skimmed over to a large degree. It wasn't really um, one of the main highlighted findings, which was uh, that the U.S. Uh, consumption of meat cannot be globalized. And I really want to elaborate on that. So US average per capita meat consumption is 120.2 kilograms per person per year. In Australia, it's pretty similar. Um, this has major implications on land, on water resources, and especially on climate. As this Western diet expands throughout uh, the developed and developing world and the rising middle class, um, according to climate modeling by the UK Department of Energy and Climate Change and the Chatham House, 
um, under the IEA two degree scenario, by the end of the century, this will result in a world that is four degrees warmer. On the other hand, if we move towards what the World Health Organization recommends as a healthy diet um, of about 90 grams per person per year, then we can actually have a good chance of avoiding two degrees of warming. Thank you. I'll take one more question. All right. Oh, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, Richard Jones from um, the Breath Office Hadley Center. Um, so in the report, you very clearly have, have identified um, a series of, of adaptation measures which will help in the future. I was just wondering whether you've done a calculation of what would happen if you were applied those measures now and how much that would improve food security for now. So you can do something now that will help people now that, but will also protect you for the future. I was just wondering whether that calculation was done as part of the study. I'll take a stab at the first question, uh, and then perhaps the, uh, the experts can uh, respond to the second question. Uh, every five years, the U.S. puts out dietary guidelines, uh, and we are due to put out uh, a set of guidelines uh, in uh, the very near future. Uh, the 2010 guidelines uh, suggested a balanced uh, diet that would include meat, uh, but focusing uh, on additional protein sources uh, with a particular emphasis on fish. Uh, so that's one response. Secondly, uh, you know, I think it is relevant to point out that uh, we are striving to figure out how to be more efficient with livestock production so that we don't necessarily create the scenario uh, that's been outlined in the question or that was based on the study. Uh, that involves a variety of, uh, of strategies uh, from uh, feed uh, that is more efficiently uh, utilized by livestock uh, that reduces uh, significantly methane production. Uh, it, it capturing that methane and converting it into more usable uh, energy sources and fuel sources. Uh, and continuing to, to look at, at breeding uh, that would allow us to be more efficient uh, in terms of the uh, protein production. Uh, so I think it's a combination of a lot of things that will take place. Uh, in educating uh, American consumers on uh, options. Uh, for example, in our school lunch program, um, we have identified Greek yogurt uh, as an interesting option uh, for youngsters to consider uh, in terms of their protein requirement. Uh, that's something that you would not have thought of perhaps 10 years ago or 20 years ago, but it's something that's pretty popular, uh, and it's so popular that we've made it part of our uh, uh, overall program after having uh, piloted it in a couple of states. So I think there are ways of adapting uh, and mitigating the consequences of that, uh, of that report. May I just add, add on to that uh, answer for that the Secretary just gave and talk about some of the countries where we work and the populations that we serve and what is necessary to provide additional information around education about cultural products and that are nutritious in the countries where they live today, uh, as opposed to adoption of diets of other countries. The challenge that we know is that most of the research on crops, and particular crops, is on about 20 different crops. There's a limited amount of research that goes into these more culturally appropriate crops. And so increasing the research and the marketing of those crops is also a very important element of providing diet diversity across the global community. So with regard to the second question, our basic charge in the report was to look ahead 20 to 30 years and then about a century ahead. So we were charged with examining the future. But in the course of doing that work, we certainly looked at a lot of adaptation stuff. I would not say that we have strong findings about the current effectiveness of adaptation, but within a major project sponsored largely by USDA called the Agricultural Model Intercomparison Project, there's some very interesting work going on looking at the effectiveness of different adaptation strategies today and how they vary region by region. And based on the work that we looked through, I would say there's clearly uh, opportunities to spread adaptation around right now more rapidly than we are and probably significant benefits that could be 
that could be found. But that was not a focus of our report. But this EGMIT work, I would, I would definitely suggest taking a look at it. This is my my team is giving me the evil eye because yesterday we had a press conference where we launched a new tool that identifies what weighting on investment and adaptation will re, how it will result in food insecurity around the global community and the, it's a time lapse or uh, time. A, a, a study over time showing 2030, 20, 2050, 2080, and the challenges of increased emissions and low adaptation versus uh, lo low emissions and, and, uh, and increased adaptation, and the difference over time that those investments will make. And so I invite you to talk to them afterwards, and they can give you more data on the actual tool, and it's available online. Thank you. One additional point to that, uh, at USDA we have uh, established a series of climate hubs. Uh, and in those climate hubs we've done an assessment of each region of the country, including uh, the Caribbean, and Puerto Rico, uh, to ask ourselves the question, what are the vulnerabilities today in terms of what's being produced, both in terms of crops, livestock, and also forested areas? And then what are the technologies and strategies to try to adapt and mitigate to the consequences? So each region of the country now has a plan uh, and it has people who are responsible for overseeing the distribution of that information to producers to encourage them to, to look at ways in which they can potentially start now to adapt. We have a series of tools. Uh, there's a GraceNet tool, there's a, a nutrient management tool, a series of, of, of mechanisms by which producers can gauge uh, the impact today of what conservation practices might, might be uh, on their land uh, that's very individualized. Uh, that can give them a better sense of, of, of how uh, proactive they can be and what the consequences. And then finally, on our conservation programs, we are uh, very focused on measurements and metrics uh, so that we're in a position to be able to, to identify, as part of our building blocks effort, uh, that we're making progress now. That, not that we're making progress 10 years from now, but that we're making progress on an annual basis. Right. We have time for one more question. I know there's a lot of questions. And We'll get it over there from my other MC, Ashley. Yes, and actually we have an online one too that I'll sneak in if that's okay with you. That's okay. fine with me. Uh, I'm, I'm the Minister of State for Environment from Somalia. I would at the outset like to uh, express my uh, profound gratitude to the uh, Whale Food Program uh, for everything that you are actually doing for the people that have been affected by the, uh, uh, the climate change in Somalia. I would also like to thank the United States of America for the assistance that it provides for, uh, for the Federal Republic of Somalia. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you have uh, linked the issue of these climate change impacts uh, to uh, uh, security and stability. In fact, there are areas in Somalia uh, that have been affected by climate change where the kids in those areas that were previously farmers producing food uh, for their livelihood that have actually turned into, uh, 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 you know, this movement called al-Shabaab uh, that have actually become radical because of the fact that, uh, uh, that their areas have actually been tremendously affected by the, uh, uh, the impacts of the climate change. Uh, that is one thing. Now, the areas that have actually been uh, uh, destroyed, uh, the, the forests in, the, in those areas were converted into charcoal. Uh, and, the, and the charcoal has actually been exported uh, to the neighboring countries. Uh, and of course, we have got ships, you will, they are European and American ships uh, in the Indian Ocean. They see these uh, ships carrying charcoal uh, to the neighboring countries, but they never stop them, despite the fact that there is a Security Council resolution which prohibits the, uh, the production and export of, uh, uh, of charcoal. So I'm very, very glad that you have linked this to security. And of course, the impact is not just a local impact, it's a global impact. We are suffering uh, from uh, the radicalization that has just recently affected even uh, 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 France. So we've got to look into the root causes of these radicalizations uh, and make sure uh, that these kids that are deprived of their livelihoods do get what they really need to survive. Thank you very much. 
And just a very brief question from online from Carol Brighton. She asks, what is the potential of promoting holistic and regenerative agriculture in reducing greenhouse gas emissions? So maybe you could comment on if that's covered at all in the report. Great, thanks for the question. So lots of things affect food security and food security affects lots of things. Um, our report is focused mostly on the first part of that question. Um, what are the effects of climate change and socioeconomic change on food security? So the questions of mitigation are really outside of our scope, um, but we see potential for a number of different kinds of agriculture um, in the world in order to address these food security issues. So no, no silver bullet, we need a lot of approaches. I think that's a very, very important point, uh, and it's a point that needs to be underscored in a conference like this, uh, that, that, that there is no single answer, uh, there is no single technology, there's no single approach, there's no single production system uh, that will essentially respond, but it, it is important for us to be, uh, uh, for information to be available so that there's a variety of choices that can be specifically fit to the needs of a particular country or particular region. Uh, that's certainly what we're doing with our Feed the Future initiative, uh, trying to be uh, very sensitive to the needs of particular countries and particular cultures uh, in the U.S. And, I, and I, I think diversity is a very important aspect of this. One in the U.S. that I think we are growing in greater appreciation, diversity of operators, diversity of size of operations, diversity of production methods, and diversity of crops. And I think you're going to see as a result of this report uh, growing interest on the part of American agriculture to look at various crop rotations, to look at various methods uh, as an adaptation and mitigation strategy. All right, thank you for that. Can we give our panelists another round of applause? I also do want to mention that Dr. Walsh has about a dozen P, uh, uh, drives with the report on them, so if you're one of the first 12 up here, you can grab yourself one. And thank you again, Secretary Vilsack, for coming to two different panels today.